This is Audible. The following is an audio renaissance presentation. What is meditation? It is not musing, not daydreaming. But as ye find your bodies made up of the physical, mental, and spiritual, it is the attuning of the mental body and the physical body to its spiritual source. These words of Edgar Cayce express, in the most simple way, the nature of meditation. It is a harmonizing of the three aspects of ourselves, body, mind, and spirit. Are you a seeker? Are you the sort of person who vaguely feels that there must be something much more to life than just physical body and material possessions? Do the outward signs of success fail to touch and nurture some deeper part of you? If so, then meditation is probably the most important thing which you could add to your life. Let me take a moment right at the beginning of this tape to give you a brief experience in meditation. Even if you've had no previous experience, you'll find this most basic kind of meditation practice easy and rewarding. Later we'll go through a bit more detailed kind of meditation procedure. Let's get a simple taste of what meditation is like. Make sure you are in a relatively quiet place where you won't be disturbed for several minutes. Sit comfortably in a chair or on a sofa. Close your eyes and first let your attention move to the conditions and feelings of your physical body. Let your attention move through your body and see if you can identify any places of stress, tension, or discomfort. Whenever you find such a place, speak to that part of your body. Invite your body to relax, to be at peace. Meditation is an experience that engages all the aspects of yourself, body, mind, and spirit. Say to yourself, my body is at peace, centered, ready to participate in this experience of meditation. Then let all of your attention move just with a simple flowing in and flowing out of your breath. Be aware of your breathing without trying to change its rate or its depth. As you breathe in, breathe in clarity, centeredness of mind, alertness. With each exhalation and more at peace, you will find that your body and your mind become more and more quiet. Now in your mind, take this simple word, peace, peace, silently. Repeat the word to yourself several times, but don't just think about peace. With each quiet repetition of the word peace, begin to feel its meaning. Experience peace in your body, in the room around you, in your mind. Hold in silent attention the feeling of peace. I am at peace. Peace flows in and through me. I am peace itself.
Now let your attention move to someone for whom you have special concerns. Someone whose life seems to need more peace. And send that person the feeling that you have experienced just now in meditation. Send that person a prayerful blessing of peace. Just with your thoughts. Then bring your attention back once again to your breathing. To the flowing in and flowing out of breath. And then, once again, back to your body and your presence in the room where you are now. And then, slowly begin to open your eyes. What is meditation? On the one hand, it is the simplest thing that we can do in life. But at the same time, meditation engages the deepest and most profound levels of who you are. Especially in the last 20 years, meditation has become a popular discipline. Tens of thousands of people from all walks of life include some form of daily meditation exercise in their lifestyle. The benefits, both those which are promised and those which are realized, include greater clarity of mind, better health, psychic sensitivity, more energy, heightened creativity, and higher physical performance. But meditation is an ancient technique. The oldest traditions admit that these benefits of meditation are in fact significant byproducts of the discipline. But ancient wisdom reminds us that there is an even more important reason for working with this spiritual technique. The Edgar Cayce readings provide a 20th century reinterpretation of ancient spiritual insights. Perhaps nowhere is Cayce's contribution greater than in helping modern men and women to see how meditation is a safe and direct method for reconnecting with the deepest spiritual realities in oneself. The Edgar Cayce readings provide an easy-to-learn approach for how to meditate, and yet this material cautions us against assuming that meditation is only a technique. For meditation to fulfill all of its potentials within you, what is required is a new outlook on life, a new way of seeing yourself and others and the universe around you. The place to start is with two universal laws concerning human nature. The first law states that there is a oneness underlying all of creation. In other words, there is a great connectedness to life. We are a part of each other and a part of the very creative forces which brought us into being. Another way in which the Edgar Cayce readings sometimes state this first law is that there is only one force or one energy in the universe. Admittedly, that one force may express itself in a number of different forms, but this principle leads us back to seeing how basic and fundamental the creative life energy really is. Using this first law, you can see that the energy which you use to get mad at someone is the same energy that you use to love them or to serve them. One way of understanding meditation is that it gives this one life force working within us a transformed way of being expressed in daily living. Meditation does not involve suppressing or repressing fear and guilt and anger so much as it involves lifting those energies to a new form of expression. The second universal law concerns the very makeup of ourselves. In spite of the oneness of all life, it can still be helpful to see ourselves as beings of three levels, body, mind, and spirit. These three have a close relationship. For example, research in psychosomatic illness demonstrates very well the impact of attitudes and emotions upon physical health. Meditation is a daily exercise which engages all three levels of your being. It is not merely a spiritual exercise, but requires the cooperation of your physical body and of your mind as well. In fact, one of the definitions offered in the Edgar Cayce readings for meditation states that it is the aligning or attuning of body, 
mind, and spirit. The next step in learning how to meditate is to clarify what the word means. It is easy to be confused concerning the difference between prayer and meditation. Let's think of prayer as being an activity of the conscious mind in which there is an outpouring of thoughts in a specific direction. In contrast to this, meditation involves a quieting of the conscious mind. It's a receptive state. The difference is most succinctly put with these words. Prayer is like talking to God, whereas meditation is like listening to God. An additional simple definition of meditation states, Meditation is listening to the divine within. This listening is, of course, with all of yourself and not just your physical ears. As you will soon see, the technique for meditation described by Edgar Cayce encourages us to a kind of openness and receptivity. In this state, we can receive inspiration and direction, which comes through a number of different avenues. But as we are open, receptive, and listening, what is it that we are listening for? This simple definition makes clear that we should be selective. The unconscious mind contains within it many levels or dimensions. In meditation, we should settle for nothing less than the highest state of consciousness. As an analogy, imagine that you've just gotten on an elevator hoping to travel to the seventh and highest floor of the building. On the way up, the elevator may stop at other levels. For example, it may stop at the third floor, and when the doors open, you may see interesting people and things going on at that level. The choice that you face is whether or not to get off the elevator at that point or to stay on the elevator and keep moving up. In this upward movement, the elevator may pause a number of times and open its doors, giving you this kind of choice. In the same fashion, you are likely to find in meditation that when you get physically still and begin to quiet your mind, that many distracting opportunities present themselves to you. Fascinating detours will grab at your attention. You may suddenly remember a childhood experience and be tempted to spend time dwelling upon the memory. You may find yourself suddenly beginning to see the answer to a problem that you've been wrestling with for weeks. You may begin to feel things going on in your physical body that normally don't go on or remain unconscious to you. Meditation involves a continual series of choices that have to be made. What is it that you're looking for in meditation? What is it that you seek? To what are you going to listen? The deepest form of meditation involves listening to the divine within yourself. Once you've considered these preliminary thoughts, you're ready to explore the specific technique that Edgar Cayce has recommended to us. It begins by selecting a time and place for meditation which can be kept consistently. You'll find it easier to keep your meditation period daily if you have a regular time period for doing it. For some people, the best time is the first thing in the morning. For others, it's just before they go to bed. But the important thing is that you find the time of day that works best for you. Ask yourself this question. As I consider the various responsibilities and demands that I have upon my time, what's the time of day when I'm most likely to be able to get still? quiet my mind and listen for the promptings of my inner spiritual life. Once you have an answer to that question, you're ready to select a place for meditation. Most importantly, you want to pick a place where you're least likely to be interrupted, but also make it a place where you can physically be relaxed and comfortable. It's important for you to consider the effect of preparation. It has a highly significant impact upon meditation quality. One kind of preparation is long-term or ongoing. The Casey readings suggest that anything you can do to keep your physical body healthy and cleansed will have a beneficial effect. This includes working with your diet and working with physical exercise. You need not wait until you are accomplishing the perfect diet or physical exercise program before starting to meditate. But just keep in mind that in the long run, what you do with your physical body is going to influence the quality of your meditation experience. 
Another kind of ongoing preparation involves working with attitudes and emotions. Probably each one of us has one or two attitudes or emotions that particularly keep us from feeling better about ourselves and about life in general. To one person, it may be a particular fear, for someone else a particular resentment. But it's important that we work on withdrawing attention from these negative emotions if we are to be successful with meditation. A more immediate kind of preparatory activity concerns what you do for an hour or two before a meditation period begins. For example, it's probably best for most people that they not eat before trying to meditate. When the physical body is occupied with digesting a large meal, it tends to draw attention to that work instead of what needs to be accomplished in meditation. Other people have found that what they read or watch on television for an hour or two before their meditation period has a strong influence. Examine your own lifestyle and try to identify those activities which are best avoided before meditation time in order to give your body, mind, and spirit the best chance of attunement. And then, just before you actually begin your meditation period, you'll probably find it helpful to try some specific exercises which are designed to help relax and center the body and mind. Many people find it helpful to work with some form of slow, deep breathing procedure. You probably know quite well the way in which your breath is related to your state of awareness. When you're frightened, your breathing changes. When you relax and go to sleep, your breathing changes. And when you're angry, your breathing pattern is altered. In a similar fashion, it may be possible through both attending to and slightly altering your breathing to begin to stimulate a change of consciousness. The simplest way to do this is to spend a couple of minutes sitting quietly in your meditation spot with your eyes closed and simply observe the flowing in and flowing out of your breath. Lightly alter the rate or depth of breathing as necessary until you find a pace which, for you, creates the feeling of relaxation and peace of mind. During this short period, let all of your attention be solely upon the flowing in and flowing out of breath. You may want to concurrently have some quieting and inspirational background music which helps your mind put aside worries and concerns of the day. The music you choose should help begin to shift your feelings to a more peaceful and centered quality. The Casey readings strongly encourage us to spend some time in prayer just before starting to meditate. We need to think of prayer and meditation as going hand in hand. Beginning a consistent commitment to meditation does not involve dropping your prayer life. In fact, the two help each other. Spend several minutes in prayer just before beginning your meditation time. You may prefer using the Lord's Prayer, one of the Psalms from the Bible. On the other hand, you may feel moved to quietly say a prayer of thanksgiving for all of the blessings of your life, or a prayer of confession in which you admit to shortcomings of the past, or a prayer of petition in which you ask for strength and guidance, especially in the meditation period soon to come. After spending time with these aids for attunement, you're now ready to enter into the meditation period itself. There are countless methods for what to do with your attention during the silence of meditation, but the Edgar Cayce readings suggest a procedure that involves a creative use of the mind in conjunction with what he called an affirmation. An affirmation is like a mantra particularly if we remember that this ancient Sanskrit word means mind tool. An affirmation is a short statement which expresses your personal spiritual ideal. Here are some examples of affirmations. Be still and know that I am God. Let me ever be a channel of blessings to others. I am filled with the light of divine mind. There are, of course, many, many possible affirmations from which you can choose for your own meditation life. The first example is a line taken from the Bible, 
The second is a phrase offered in one Edgar Cayce reading. The third example was written by one meditator for herself. It's up to you to choose an affirmation that will be personally meaningful. The words of the affirmation must resonate to the best within yourself. The affirmation must be a verbal expression of that to which you aspire spiritually. Usually it's easiest to work with an affirmation if you keep it short. But the question, of course, remains, how does one work with an affirmation? How is the affirmation used in meditation? The key is to understand the difference between the words themselves and the feeling or spirit that the words evoke from within yourself. For example, let's suppose that you've selected as your affirmation the words, Let me be a channel of blessings to others. It would not be a very effective meditation procedure for you to spend 10 or 15 minutes sitting silently with your eyes closed, just saying those words over and over again to yourself. Meditation is listening to the divine within. What is needed is an open, receptive state of consciousness. What you're looking for is silence, and not the routine of merely repeating words time and again. The technique described in the Casey readings instructs you to repeat your affirmation either aloud or silently several times until you begin to feel its meaning. In this example, the affirmation would be repeated until you begin to get the feeling of giving to others. No doubt we've all had the experience, at least occasionally in life, of doing things for others with absolutely no expectation of getting something in return. It's that kind of feeling that we are hoping that the words of the affirmation will evoke. Once the words have awakened that spirit, that feeling, the next step is to cease repeating the affirmation and to hold in silent attention the feeling of the affirmation. Of course, you're probably asking yourself, how long can I hold that feeling before my mind wanders off to distracting thoughts? Probably at first you'll discover that after only five or ten seconds, your mind will wander to concerns about interpersonal relationships or your health or financial matters. It is at that point that you bring your attention back by saying silently in your mind the affirmation once again. It may require several repetitions of the affirmation before you find yourself once again back in touch with the spirit behind the words. And then, as you have the feeling back, hold it in silence. Experience your body, mind, and soul as being cooperatively joined together and infused with the purposefulness and meaningfulness those words express. No doubt in a typical meditation period of five or ten minutes of silence, you'll find yourself having to come back from a distraction many times. Don't get discouraged. Everyone who is learning to meditate goes through this difficult process of learning to focus attention. Even those who've been meditating for years find that they frequently have to bring their attention back by repeating the affirmation once again. How long should you plan to spend in the silence period? At first, you'll probably want to limit yourself to just three or four minutes and slowly begin to build up the time period over the course of many weeks. Most people find that they want to build up to a period of at least 15 or 20 minutes of silence. Don't feel frustrated if that sounds like an extraordinarily long period of time when you're first getting started. It does to everyone. You may also be wondering what you should expect to experience during the silence. In the deepest sense, it's not important whether or not you have the experience of any unusual phenomena. Actual changes are taking place in your physical body and in your subconscious mind as you complete this meditation discipline regularly. You'll probably begin to observe in your daily living a greater sense of self-determination and control, as well as a greater peace of mind in challenging situations. Those are the real fruits that we're looking for, not the intriguing phenomena that occasionally occur to meditators. Nevertheless, there are some things that may happen to you, and it would be well to think about them now for a moment, just so these experiences won't alarm you if they happen. Some meditators feel a certain lightheadedness or lightness of body. This can be attributed to consciousness altering, so that it is less attached to three-dimensional physical reality. 
That is not to say that you should try to have an out-of-body experience while you're meditating. In fact, the Casey readings express the importance of bringing the consciousness of higher reality into the physical body as we meditate. A feeling of lightness or disengagement is a natural experience which you may or may not have happen to you. However, if it does, rather than spend time focusing on the phenomenon, bring your attention once again back to the affirmation. You may experience a movement of energy within your body. For some people, this is felt as a tingling along the spine or a certain pressure or activity in certain spots of the body, such as the forehead, the top of the head, the throat, or the heart region. As long as this is not uncomfortable, you can look upon it simply as a sign that changes are taking place. Many people also experience vivid visual imagery. If you think back to the analogy of the elevator, however, it's important to make a conscious choice as to what it is that you seek in meditation. You may want to take note of visual impressions that are awakened, but then move attention back to the affirmation. That same kind of visual material can easily be contacted every night in your dream state, and dreams are probably a more effective way to work with impressions rising from the subconscious mind. The same principle holds true with regard to flashes of color or light. Again, these phenomena are indicative of something happening, and yet we can lose the purpose for meditation if we start paying attention to their interesting effects instead of keeping the focus on the spirit of the affirmation chosen. At the end of your meditation periods, it's important to conclude with another period of prayer. In this case, the Edgar Casey readings encourage us to work with prayer for healing. You may wish to maintain a short prayer list of people for whom you have concern and send a blessing to those individuals by silently holding their names and sending love to them. In a sense, this closing activity completes the circuit. As we have been still and felt lifted, healed and energized ourselves in the silence of meditation then we share what we have received by directing it outward to others through prayer the gonads are the endocrine glands that correspond to the first spiritual center in the male these are the testes in the female, the ovaries. This center has to do with our instinct to seek sustenance. In some Eastern schools of thought, this center is referred to as the root chakra. Symbolically, for instance, in dreams, this center and its activities can be represented by the color red, the element earth, and the symbolic visions of the bull or calf. The second center, the cells of Leidig, has to do with our experiences related to the male-female balance within us. This center is related to the biological instinct for propagation of the species. The cells of Leidig are found within the gonads as interstitial cells. They secrete the sex hormone testosterone, a masculizing hormone that affects the secondary sexual characteristics and is produced in both sexes. In a corresponding way, some slight production of female hormones takes place in the testes. The cells of Leidig are found in greater number in the testes than in the ovaries. This center is represented by the color orange, the element water, and the androgynous man as a symbol. The third spiritual center is associated with the adrenal glands and especially relates to our sense of power in the earth and to the instinct for self-preservation. The adrenal glands themselves are frequently associated with the fight-or-flight instinct. In this same region of the body is a gathering of nerves, the solar plexus. The color that represents this center is yellow. The element is fire, and the symbolic animal is the lion. The fourth spiritual center, the thymus, has largely to do with our experiences related to love in the earth. It has been found to play a most important role in defense against disease, the immune system, and is especially concerned with lymphocytes, which make up a part of the white blood cell count.
The thymus has two lobes and is found directly behind the breastbone. It is frequently symbolized by a bird, such as the eagle, by the color green and the element air, which reflects its location near the lungs. These first four centers relate particularly to our experiences in the earth. They are often referred to as the four lower centers, lower in the sense that they are located in the lower part of the body, but also because they are concerned most frequently with man's survival and expression in the earth. The thyroid center concerns the faculty of the will. Physiologically, this center relates to the thyroid gland which surrounds the windpipe. The hormones secreted by this gland control the metabolism rate in the body, or how fast the body uses energy. The color symbolic to the fifth center is blue or gray, and the element is ether. The pineal gland relates to the sixth center. It is most often referred to in mystical literature as being the higher mind or the Christ center. In meditation, we seek to move the creative energy associated with the cells of Leidig center directly to the pineal center. At that point, the energy is able to take on the qualities of consciousness related to the pineal center, the mind of Christ, and it is then able to overflow into the pituitary and move back down, affecting the functions of the lower center, healing and integrating our activities. The color for this sixth center is indigo. The pituitary center. The quality of consciousness of this highest center is oneness, the awareness of the oneness of all life. The pituitary secretes many different types of hormones, those that control the menstrual cycle, the growth hormone, and hormones that affect the functions of the thyroid and adrenals. Because of its effect on all the other glands, it is referred to as the master gland. The symbolic color for the seventh center is violet. The spiritual centers as transducers have two primary functions. One is illustrated by this analogy from the Casey readings. Think of the spiritual aspect of our being as light. Now, consider how a slide projector works. It has a bulb which projects light onto a screen, and it has a slide, the image or pattern that this light projects. The light of the spirit shines through a pattern of consciousness and manifests itself as a projection, our physical experience. What we want to do in meditation is to develop a different way of responding. With our minds, we can remove the slide of resentful or angry patterns and replace it with one that is more constructive. By dwelling upon spiritually awakening affirmations, we are selecting new patterns, patterns that are there already, but usually do not get chosen. The second function is related to the phrase, opening a center. To open these centers means to modify the barrier between the infinite and the finite aspects of ourselves. The opening of the centers may be the normal accompaniment of deep meditation, or it may be brought about by drugs, breathing exercises, yogic postures, mantras, religious rituals, for example, the dance of the whirling dervishes, or even physical disorders such as spinal lesion. In the interpretations which the Casey readings offer, we find a clue to the proper way to open the centers. It is the spirit of the Christ that should open the spiritual centers of the body. As we live the life of love, these centers open naturally. In this way, intense experiences come only as we are able to use them for our own growth. The spiritual centers serve as transducers throughout our daily activities. In meditation, we seek to redirect the way in which the energy flows through these centers. Our aim is to move the creative energy associated with the Leidig center directly to the pineal center. This movement in the east is referred to as the Kundalini. This movement of energy throughout the body during meditation is experienced by different people in different ways. Some feel a slight pressure in the area of one of the spiritual centers, such as the heart region or in the middle of the forehead. Some people feel tingling in certain parts of the body, such as the spine.
Occasionally this experience is felt as two different energies, one moving upward from the base of the spine, the Kundalini pathway, and the other, like the Pentecostal flames of the Holy Spirit, moving downward and touching the body in the region of the head. The Kesey readings suggest that the Lord's Prayer describes the proper movement of energy in meditation. If you look at it as a specific prayer of attunement, there is a way you can use it at the beginning of each meditation period before you begin to work with your affirmation. You'll want to feel the meaning of each portion of the prayer, the meaning it has within your mind and within your body. Our Father, who art in heaven, is directed to the pituitary center and can be used to awaken the awareness of oneness. We might relate this to the concept of one God. As we say, hallowed be thy name, we should feel the presence of the Christ mind within us. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, is directed to the thyroid center and is appropriate to awaken a consciousness of the obedient will. So we can see that the Lord's Prayer begins by addressing the upper three centers, affirming the supremacy of God within ourselves. In essence, the message directed to the lower centers is, as the energy awakens, let it move through each of you without awakening patterns that are out of harmony with the ideal. First, the prayer addresses the gonads, which have been described as a motor or generator of the body. It says, Give us this day our daily bread. With this phrase we are requesting access in this meditation to only that amount of energy that we can use constructively, no more than that. Next, the prayer addresses the solar plexus or adrenal centers. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Here we want to focus on the quality of forgiveness. When we can do this, the energy is able to move on and not get caught up in the awakening of old patterns of fear or resentment. Certainly we may have problems at the level of this spiritual center, but we are going to deal with them later as the energy flows down. Then the prayer moves on and addresses the cells of Leidig with the words, Lead us not into temptation. That is to say, do not allow the energy to dwell here and awaken the patterns at this level. The constant temptation is to look at life in terms of duality instead of oneness, to think of God as being apart from us. The cells of Leidig Center has especially to do with this sense of division, which is reflected in the male-female polarity. As we bring an ideal into our work of balancing the male and female energies within us, we experience underlying oneness. So here we can focus on and feel that presence within, which leads us and directs us. And finally, the prayer addresses the thymus center, saying, Deliver us from evil. Again, the idea expressed here is, do not allow the energy to awaken the patterns at this level. If we think of evil as the lack of love, then we can see the relationship between these words and the thymus center. We are speaking to the center and asking that the energy pass through and not awaken patterns associated with memories of our failure to love truly. The prayer ends by affirming again the triune Godhead within. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. In saying this prayer and feeling its meaning, we are moving toward the optimum physical conditions for meditation. Let's take time now and conduct an actual meditation session together. The first few times you try to meditate, you may want to use this tape procedure just as it proceeds. However, later, as you are prepared to have longer and longer periods of silence, you may want to stop using the tape or have the tape recorder nearby where you can put it in the pause mode, allowing a length of time for the silence greater than what we'll have now. To conduct our meditation session together, 
make sure you are in a quiet room where you won't be disturbed for the next 20 minutes. Perhaps you'd like to stand up and stretch before starting to make sure that your body won't be restless. Perhaps the best position for you to learn to meditate is sitting in a chair with your feet flat on the floor and your back reasonably straight. However, if you strongly prefer sitting on the floor cross-legged or lying on your back, these postures are, of course, acceptable as well. The important thing is to find a position for your body that will allow it to be relaxed, but without going to sleep. Now, feeling comfortable in your meditation posture, let's begin by preparing ourselves. Edgar Casey recommended a simple head and neck exercise designed to help alleviate much of the stress and tension that we store in the neck and shoulder areas. Follow along with me and do this exercise. Slowly let your head drop forward with your chin toward your chest and then bring your head back to an upright position. And complete that movement a second and a third time. Now let your head drop back and then return it to an upright position. And complete that procedure a second and a third time. As you're doing this head and neck exercise, let your attention be upon its relaxing effect on the neck and shoulder areas. Now turn your head as far as you comfortably can to the right, as if you were watching someone pass by, and then bring your head back to a straight ahead position. Now complete that movement a second and a third time. Next, complete three repetitions to the left side three times. The final portion of this exercise recommended in the Casey readings involves circular movements of the head. Let your head drop forward chin toward the chest and then rotate the entire head around in a clockwise direction first three circles and then three circles back in a counterclockwise direction. Next, we'll do a breathing exercise. Allow the background music that you hear to touch your subconscious mind. Don't be concerned about listening to the music or analyzing it. Just allow its quieting and centering effect to work upon you without any effort on your part. Just let all of your attention be on the flowing in and flowing out of your breath. With each inhalation, feel yourself breathing in light and centeredness. With each exhalation, you're letting go of any tension or stress in your body. You find that you're becoming more and more relaxed, and yet, at the same time, alert, centered, 
and feeling a deep desire to know firsthand that inner spiritual core of who you are. Just let your attention be on your breathing. Find a rate and a depth of breath that for you creates a sense of peace and relaxation for your body, and yet a full presence of mind and attention here in the present moment. Let's take a moment for prayer, either to say the Lord's Prayer silently to yourself or a personal prayer. Remember, prayer is an activity an outpouring of your conscious mind. Express your sense of desire, your motivation for this upcoming meditation period. Now move your attention to the affirmation that we'll use for this meditation period. Peace. Be still. Let's say it aloud together. And then move to saying it silently within your mind. Repeat it to yourself only as long as it takes for you to get the spirit of the feeling behind the words. Peace, be still, and then hold that spirit, that feeling and silent attention for as long as you can, coming back to the words only when you need them to reorient you from having drifted away. Let's say the affirmation first aloud three times, and then silently, just now. Now as we come out of the silence, let's take a short time for prayer. Prayer for others for whom we have concern.
prayer for the work of peace and understanding on this earth. Now slowly begin to bring your attention back. First back to your breathing for just a moment, back to your physical body, and then be aware once again of the room in which you now sit, and then slowly open your eyes. <laughs>